They say that all the glitters isn't gold, but I say that all the coagulates isn't aureus. In addition to Staphylococcus aureus, there are a small number of other coagulase-positive staphylococci. We become increasingly aware of these due to improvements in identification methods used in clinical laboratories. Staphylococcus argenteus is a coagulase-positive staph staphylococcus that, until now, had mainly been detected in Australia, the Pacific Islands, and Thailand. It was thought that the species might be geographically restricted. However, a paper in the June issue of the Journal of Clinical Microbiology describes a number of isolates collected from patients in North America. We'll be talking to two of the authors of this paper. Welcome to Editors in Conversation. This episode is brought to you by the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, available at jcm.asm.org and on Twitter at jclinmicro. I'm JCM Editor-in-Chief Alex McAdam. This podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes JCM. Joining me are two authors of the paper entitled Phenotypic and Genomic Profiling of Staphylococcus argenteus in Canada and the United States and Recommendations for Clinical Result Reporting. We'll put the link to the paper in the show notes. Dr. Julianne Kuss is a clinical microbiologist at the Public Health Ontario Laboratory and an assistant professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology at the University of Toronto. Julianne, thanks for joining us. Thanks, great to be here. Also joining us is Dr. Audrey Schutz, Dr. Schutz is co-director of the Bacteriology Laboratory and a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology at the Mayo Clinic. Audrey, I'm glad you could join us. Thanks for having me. Many of us equate coagulase positive staph with Staphylococcus aureus, but we might have the vague notion that it's more complicated than that. Audrey, could you give us an introduction to the other coagulase positive Staphylococci? Sure. So yes, actually it's not just Staph aureus anymore. Uh, in addition to the organisms we discussed in this paper, other coagulase-positive species include many of the animal-adapted staphylococci or the zoonotic staphylococci, which are considered part of the staph intermedius group. And this group includes staph intermedius, staph pseudintermedius, which is found in dogs, staph delphini, in dolphins and horses mostly, staph schlieferi, subspecies coagulans in dogs, and there are others. These particular species are members of the skin microbiota in animals, and they can colonize animals uh, and can cause infections in animals too, but they can cross over into humans. And this is most commonly seen with uh, staph intermedius that can end up causing skin and soft tissue infections in humans due to uh, canine bites or, or other invasive uh, disease in immunocompromised humans. Thank you. Julianne, how, how did your laboratory first notice that coagulase-positive staphylococci that were thought to be staph aureus weren't really staph aureus? We have to go back in time a little bit to 2017, so pre-COVID pre times. Um, at that, we're a reference lab in Ontario. We um, perform uh, confirmation of identification, susceptibility te testing, and typing for, for bacteria throughout the province. Um, and that time we received a, a couple of, uh, a cluster of staph aureus that were thought to be involved in a possible um, transmission event and award on one of the hospitals. And they wanted to see whether or not they were MRSA um, staph aureus. So all of our testing, our routine uh, confirmatory tests like coagulase, P PYR testing, Malditoff, um, indicated that it was staph aureus. We then uh, ran it on our MEC-A PCR to detect whether MEC-A was there. Uh, one of the positive controls in our PCR is the NUC gene, um, which is supposed to be the positive control confirming Staph aureus. And so that PCR for those three isolates under investigation was positive for MEC-A and negative for the NUC gene. All the other controls worked, everything else on the run worked, and. We were just kind of scratching our head at that time, like, is there something wrong with the assay? Something wrong with this bug? Like, what's going on? And I think at the time we had some extra room on a, on a next-gen sequencing run and thought, why don't we just pop them on? We're lucky to have those facilities in-house. And, you know, ran them, pulled out some of the data, looked at the 16S gene, looked at the Nuke gene, did some comparisons, and, and lo and behold, it said this was Staph argentius uh, as opposed to Staph aureus. Um, this was kind of news to us because we weren't really familiar with this at the time. And 
In fact, I think it was just a year or two before that this organism was initially reported in the literature. Um, and so that got us, uh, that got us thinking about how we identify this organism, what it means for identifying Staph aureus. And, um, and at the time, this was not in the MALDI-TOF databases. Um, I think a year after this first encounter in our lab, it was added to one of the MALDI-TOF databases. And then we began to see it with some increasing frequency in our lab. So just to, to make sure I've got it right, it was just that nuke PCR that flagged this as unusual. If you had not done this, this just would have gone through as Staph aureus and you would have gone on happily with life. That's correct. So you can imagine that, you know, not everything that comes in as, as Staph aureus or queries Staph aureus into a, a reference lab goes for a, a MEC APCR, right? That would only yeah. be a subset of organisms. So many of them may have actually passed through previously without ever being noticed. We did, I think, go through some of our um, our historic organisms that were nuke or nuke ne negative um, to investigate those further to see if any of those were missed Staph argentius, and I don't believe that any of those were. We didn't have a large collection at the time, so this, you know, in our understanding, was the first the first set that we identified that at least were methicillin resistant. So these were really methicillin resistant. Uh, Staph Argentius. Thank you. Fascinating. Audrey, would you tell us how the two groups that worked together in this study collected the isolates and, and what kind of infections those isolates were associated with? Sure. So we gathered isolates that were sent to our laboratories for identification or, or isolates that we obtained from patient specimens that came in directly. So uh, we further investigated the isolates that resulted in certain MALDI mass spec profiles uh, for which Staph Argentius or Staph Schweitzeri was listed amongst the best matches. Um, clinical presentations were pretty variable. Most of the isolates did cause infections. Um, some of these were soft, uh, soft tissue infections. Some of them were skin infections, bone and joint infections, and even bacteremia. Um, some were not considered to be pathogenic by the clinicians and instead were picked up just on surveillance screens. Um, and I guess I'd like to point out that our experience with these isolates in this study, uh, the fact that they caused a range of infections, really reflects what's published in the literature on this, in, including the fact that some of these are pathogenic and others are, are colonizers. Thank you. So, so colonization, invasive infections, isolates from sterile sites sounds a lot like another coagulase positive staphylococcus. Um, a lot of our listeners are probably wondering whether their microbiology lab would correctly identify uh, Staphylococcus argentius. One of the things I liked about your paper particularly is that it includes detailed results about how several methods of identification work with this species. So Audrey, let's start with the basic biochemical identification methods. Are there reliable ways to phenotypically identify the species? Uh, yes. In short, actually, there are no <laughs> reliable uh, <laughs> phenotypic methods for identifying. Um, just starting with the colonial morphology of these, uh, the colonial morphology of Staphylococcus argentius may suggest a staph. You'll see perhaps some beta hemolysis, although that really isn't consistently seen. Uh, but Staph argentius lacks that yellowish color that we sometimes see, usually see with Staph aureus. Um, that's because it lacks that gene cluster uh, staphyloxanthin uh, that encodes the, car uh, the carotenoid pigment uh, that Staph aureus sometimes has. Um, and Staph argentius are actually grayish in color, and hence the name argentius from the Latin word argentum for silver. Um, but the color is really best seen on certain augers, and um, in our hands, it was really best seen after 48 hours of incubation. So all of these aspects together really make it difficult uh, to rely, obviously, on colonial morphology. Um, Staph Schweitzeri has been reported to have a yellowish pigment, um, but I we don't see these yet in human infections, so I think we just need to learn more about that one and its colonial morphology. 
Um, the isolates are uh, tube coagulase positive uh, for staphylocoagulase, uh, which is the free coagulase we measure, um, and they are PYR negative, um, as staph aureus is as well. So phenotypically, unless you're really lucky and have the right have the culture at the right time on the right auger and happen to notice the color, there's probably nothing that's going to tip you off. Not much phenotypically. All right. Um, Julianne, many of us think of 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing as a more accurate method for identification of bacteria, more accurate than phenotypic testing. How well does 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing work for identification of staph or gentius? So that's a great question. And, you know, 16S, like we're a reference lab, 16S is a, a go-to method for us for helping identify, uh, challenging to identify bacteria or aiding with validations. Um, so that was one of the first things that we did with this organism is, is look at the 16S. And really, there's almost no sequence diversity between the members of this complex, the Staph aureus complex, that would include Staph aureus, Staph argentius, and Staph schweitzeri. So using 16S alone, we really cannot distinguish between these three. They're, they're over 99% similar to one another. So um, this is not totally uncommon for some organisms. There's other groups of organisms that need additional targets beyond 16S to get to a species level identification. And, you know, we have some guidelines like CLSI MM18 has suggestions for other targets that people can use to help differentiate closely related species. You know, for instance, the members within strep mitis group are very difficult to um, differentiate with just 16S alone. Um, but it is really difficult to incorporate lots and lots of different primer sets for different organism groups within your workflow. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, MaldiTOF has been so wonderful, is that it really, much of the time, works really, really well in identifying um, these, like, organisms to species level in, in an easy way. Um, but 16S in this case is not useful. All right, so phenotype is a bust, 16S is a bust. Um, I was interested in what you found about the ability of sequencing the gene for the thermostable nuclease of Staphylococcus argentius. And this comes back to what you were telling us about with the nuke gene um, in your initial uh, uh, noticing, initially noticing these organisms. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so that, that's right. Like that's how we originally identified these in our lab was that these were nuke negative. And if you Look at the sequence um, diversity between in, in the nuke gene between Staph aureus, Staph argentius, and Staph schweitzeri. There is quite a lot of diversity, and it's an excellent target for differentiating um, between the three species if you're going to um, do PCR and then sequence analysis. Um, there's a clear separation between these three groups. And I think both both the my group here at Public Health Ontario and, and Audrey's group at the Mayo are looking at you know, easier ways to kind of take advantage of that of that diversity to to identify um, these three species, maybe in a you know a, a real time PCR type assay. Um, but yeah, so nuke has some potential, but you know, granted, it's not routinely used um, in most settings. So let's so labs that are lucky enough to have sequencing capacity can sequence the nuke gene. Uh, most of us these days, I think, are relying on MALDI-TOF. Uh, Audrey, how did MALDI-TOF do for identification of isolates of Staph argentius in the study? So, um, so we were using the MALDI-TOF Brooker biotyper, uh, the RUO databases at the time. And generally, they performed well at identifying Staph argentius as one of the top matched species. Um, with scores at or above uh, 2.0 for the species level. So amongst those top match species, most of the time Staph argentius was actually the top score, but sometimes Staph aureus was the top score and rarely Staph schweitzeri was actually the top score uh, for these organisms that ended up being Staph argentius. 
Um, so moving forward in the lab, we of course have had um, database updates since then, and we follow this in our quality reports. And we have seen that with the recent database updates, we're seeing more consistent readings of Staph argenteus as the top reading when the isolate is indeed Staph argenteus. So just to make sure I've got it, you're seeing Staph argenteus as the, the top identification. Are you also seeing Staph schweitzeri and Staph aureus sometimes landing with acceptable levels of identification as well? Yes, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. So it sounds like it's still uh, a work in progress for Multitoff, but there is hope on the horizon. Yes, agree. All right, so let's switch a little bit from um, identification methods and talk about uh, the results of susceptibility testing. And Audrey, you did a, quite a lot of susceptibility testing on the isolates in your study. What, what did you find uh, in looking at that? Yeah, yeah. So we did um, antimicrobial susceptibility testing by auger dilution, and we also did um, uh, cefoxetin disc testing, uh, D tests as well for inducible clindamycin resistance and inducible beta lactamase testing. We had we had a variety of things that we did in this in this study, and generally these isolates did show low MICs to most antimicrobials. Um, of note, they were all clindamycin susceptible. About half of them were penicillin resistant. And we had three isolates which had oxacillin MICs that were above two, which is the, uh, within the resistant range for staph uh, aureus if you apply the staph aureus breakpoints. And interestingly, all three of those were MECA positive by the in-house in -house, um, MECA PCR and also by whole genome sequencing. And um, we also saw that the cefoxetin discs for those three isolates were also concordant with the oxacillin um, MIC results when interpreting according to the uh, Staph aureus breakpoints. And you mentioned applying Staph aureus breakpoints to this species. Um, I think the CLSI has given us some help on this recently. Can you tell us what CLSI, the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, is recommending for reporting Staph argenteus? Absolutely. So we, we were very happy to have the opportunity to present our data, these data, to the CLSI AST subcommittee for their input. And they came out with two different recommendations, um, or two recommendations. One of them was that if a laboratory is going to report to the species level, you should report this isolate, the uh, Staph argenteus isolate, as Staph aureus complex, and then in parentheses, Staph argenteus at the end. And these reporting guidelines align with the uh, European ESCMID uh, study group on staphylococcal diseases. That's also what they suggested. Uh, for reporting. And the second recommendation that CLSI had applied was that uh, laboratories should apply the Staph aureus breakpoints and interpretive categories and also use Staph aureus phenotypic methods when you're working with Staph argenteus. And so this proper reporting, I, I just wanted to um, uh, stay on this just a, a little bit to emphasize this proper reporting is so important for clinicians and for laboratories. So from the clinical side, if laboratories were to report this as just Staph argenteus and not indicate to the physician that this is part of the Staph uh, complex, Staph aureus complex members, uh, the treating clinician may not recognize the organism and may not actually take the result as seriously as they could or should may not even treat, they may consider it a contaminant. And from the laboratory side, we need to make sure that we apply the correct breakpoints because as we know, there are different breakpoints for oxacillin and vancomycin for Staph aureus versus non-Staph aureus. And um, if the wrong breakpoints are applied for these, uh, for a Staph argenteus, for example, you could end up overcalling oxacillin resistance, which is a missed opportunity for um, optimal antimicrobial therapy and stewardship. Thank you. Uh, Julianne, you did whole genome sequencing on each of the isolates of Staph argenteus, and you compared those to some of the related staphylococci we've mentioned. Now, there is a lot to unpack from these data. Can you start by explaining how closely Staph argenteus is related to Staph aureus and the other members of the complex? Yeah, so, I mean, I can't go into all the detail. I, you're right, there's a lot of information um, in the paper. And, uh, but I would like to just highlight a few things. So we 
you know, we were able to do whole genome sequencing on all the 22 clinical isolates that we had in the study, as well as um, some reference, uh, the reference isolates. Um, we did a few different comparative analyses uh, at first, just to look at um, how well these, these organisms separate from one another. So we did both a single nucleotide variant type comparison, as well as whole genome uh, approach. And, and using both of these methods, you can see when you plot it out in a phylogenetic tree, you can clearly see the, the clustering of each of these three species. So all of the Staph argenteus cluster very, really well together. All the Staph schweitzeri cluster well together, and the Staph aureus are distinct from those other two species. So that was one of the first things we did. I mean, the other, one of the other high level type of analyses we looked at was looking at average nucleotide identity. So this is um, something that I think is, in, is increasingly being used in this genomic era to define what is a bacterial species. So there's like a cutoff of 96%. So if you have less than 96% average nucleotide identity between your organism or your sequence of interest and a type strain of that species, you're just considered a distinct species. So I think this is a, a nice definition. And we had um, looked at all of our Staph argenteus and all the clinical isolates that we looked at were 99%, had a 99% average nucleotide identity to one another, as well as to the type strain of Staph argenteus. But when you compared Staph argenteus to even Staph schweitzeri, which we know is closely related within the complex, it was only 90, had a 92% average nucleotide identity, so well below that 96%, and also only an 87% average nucleotide identity to Staph aureus. So a clear distinction. And this is one of the reasons, or this is some of the rationale during, like, in the initial description of, of Staph argentis, argentius, that it really deserved to be considered a distinct species. Thank you. Um, we know a lot about clonal types of Staph aureus, um, and you perform typing of Staph argentius um, by analyzing those same data by a number of techniques, some of which you mentioned. What can you tell us about the population of Staph argentius that you, in, in your study? What kind of diversity was there? Are you beginning to see that there are specific types of it? Yeah, so we were able to take that whole genome sequencing data and extract the information that, that we would normally use to um, for MLST typing or SCC MEC typing. Um, and what we really found, I mean, when we look at we, we found that there is probably within not in the it is the strains that we looked at in North America, um, and that doesn't represent all of North America. These are you know our our two groups. Um, that there was a one predominant uh, sequence type, and that was the ST2250, which is also the sequence type that's actually found or has been reported most commonly internationally. So that's the the strain or the type that seems to be predominant. Um, and that was represented in both the American collection as well as the Canadian collection. But we also did find some additional uh, sequence types, some previously not very well described, which you know shows that there is diversity within this population in North America, and that it's not just the clonal expansion of, of one particular sequence type in North America. So we have a variety of sequence types. Thank you. And I want to circle back to something we were talking about before and uh, link the sequencing to the susceptibility results. So what antibiotic resistance genes did you find in that whole genome analysis and how did those correlate with the phenotypic susceptibility results? Yeah, so there's a lot of, you know, amazing um, free databases and, and tools online for for looking for things like virulence genes, resistance genes from your sequencing data. Um, we used um, we used one that you know we really like here. It's called the CARD database, um, and it was able to extract or identify sequences uh, for genes that are commonly associated with many different types of resistance mechanisms. So we did find the MECA genes in the in or the sequences for MECA within the isolates that we know to have MECA both phenotypically as well as um, through our, you know, conventional PCR. Um, and then we found many, many different types of genes uh, that are associated with antibiotic efflux to a variety of antibiotics. 
So I won't list them all here. They're all listed in a big table in the paper, but, you know, they include, you know, efflux for fluoroquinolones, tetracyclines, penicillins, macrolides, and uh, aminoglycosides. We also found beta-lactamase gene, so a BAZ gene, um, as well as genes associated with aminoglycoside modifying enzymes that can confer resistance to gentamicin. So I think the really neat thing was that, you know, what we found using the whole genome sequence, you know, extraction of this information really was mirrored very well with what our phenotypic results found. And, and like you said, we looked at a large panel of, of drugs phenotypically, and I think this was a really nice, you know, confirmation that the whole genome is a, is a great way to, to to scan this information because it correlated very really nicely phenotypically. Thank you. And you also looked for genes for virulence factors in Staph argentius. And what did you find when you looked for those? Yeah, so I mean, we took a similar approach to what we did for the antimicrobial resistance markers. Um, and there's a lot of variety in terms of uh, virulence uh, markers between the strains that we looked at. Um, we found many different uh, sequences for genes associated with um, adherence, different secreted enzymes, uh, genes that encode uh, components for immune evasion, uh, lots of different toxins, inclu including enterotoxins, exfoliative toxins. And interestingly, you know, I think anyone who knows anything about Staph aureus, knows about Panton Valentine leukocidin. <laughs> we found one isolate that actually was positive for PVL uh, and another one that was positive for the toxic shock syndrome gene. So um, a large a large variety. Um, interestingly, um, the Staph Schweitzeri uh, type strain that we also looked at, you know, also has, you know, many different virulence factors that are commonly, or at least the sequences for virulence factors <laughs> that are commonly associated with Staph aureus. And like Audrey said at the beginning, you know, that, that, that organism hasn't really been um, identified as being a human pathogen to date. But, you know, to date, I don't think that we've really been able to identify it very well in the lab. So, you know, the jury is still out on what that will look like. Um, we had a lot of, you know, about over 30% of the isolates that we looked at were involved in, um, clinic probably in clinical disease from sterile sites and you know i think we've shown that they likely have you know many different virulence traits or virulence factors this has to be followed up on clearly in in, in the lab but um i think you know once we are able to clearly identify this organism we'll be able to start you know collecting that information to see whether or not you know clinically there's any differences between staph argentius and staph aureus and yeah we have to start with being able to identify it so but at least in terms of the the genes for virulence factors it sounds like it roughly mirrors uh staph aureus nothing jumped out as being different is that is that right nothing really jumped out as being different i mean i think the um the the staphylozanthin um component that audrey referred to at at the beginning the carotenoid um, complex is sometimes thought to be a virulence factor within Staph aureus, which mm. is clearly not present with, within Staph argentius. Um, but overall, I would say no, everything looks um, pretty similar. Um, but this will all have to be kind of, you know, fleshed out a bit more in the lab. This is just a, a genomic analysis. We have to look to see, you know, whether these things are actually expressed and, and how they're expressed uh, in vivo. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this has been absolutely fascinating. I think there is a lot more to come on these coagulase-positive staphylococci other than staph aureus. Julianne, thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Audrey, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for an interesting discussion. Thank you. And thanks for listening.